like this one person turned to me and said, Rituparna, what's happening? What's happening to us? I said, nothing. Story. Stories are happening to you. For the yeah. first time, you have you have found a space to tell a story which fits a prompt. Being a mother put me under a spotlight, a very uncomfortable spotlight for, for my employer. And now I'm going to try and turn it around and own the spotlight. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Confidence Storytelling Podcast. Now, this is a very special episode because I've got a very special guest. Now, this guest I have been pursuing for the last six months or so, uh, but due to certain reasons, uh, sometimes she was not available, sometimes I was not, and there were things happening on our lives that we couldn't connect. So at the start of 2024, I reached out to her that now why not start 2024 with a bang and coincidentally she is on a podcasting break. So she has her own podcast, but she is not releasing new episodes. So that's how we could get some time and I'm so excited to have her here. So her name is Rituparna Ghosh. Rituparna Ghosh is an international storyteller a TEDx speaker and founder of Your Story Bag, a storytelling training and consulting company. Rituparna works with listeners, children, adults, organizations, not-for-profits, corporates, helping them all harness the power of stories. Sounds familiar? <laughs> she is also a curator and performance storyteller, and she has performed at several storytelling festivals across India and also abroad. Now in this episode, she's going to share her journey from going from being a television producer to becoming a storyteller. We're going to also get into the realms of what are some of the myths that people have when it comes to storytelling. What is it that we can do to become a better storyteller? And is there a career when it comes to storytelling? How you should get away from milking the stories? Yeah, that was an amazing concept. And how you shouldn't be a copycat storyteller. So I am so excited. Let's let's dive into it and let's hear from Rituparna Ghosh, the storyteller. All right, welcome uh, Ritu Parna. Welcome to the Confident Storytelling Podcast. Uh, for my listeners, this has been probably about six months journey where I've been trying to get Ritu Parna. Sometime her schedule was not available. Sometime I was not available. So I'm so excited that we are starting 2024 with this amazing podcast. So welcome once again, Ritu Parna. Thank you so much, Haritosh. Uh, you made me sound as if I'm very busy through the year, which sounds very nice. But <laughs> thank you for pursuing me and uh, making sure that we're having this conversation at the start of the year. I'm on a podcast break myself, but I miss the microphone and I love talking. Yeah. So, um, and the greatest joy of my life is to talk about what I love the most, which is storytelling. So yes. yeah, happy to talk, talk to you. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you as well. And I'll, I'm going to start off by telling a story when I first met you and and that time you asked me okay what kind of storytelling you do and how what kind of people do you coach and I said to you something that no uh, I am helping businesses I'm helping individuals but I am not into kids storytelling and and that time you actually sort of challenged me uh, which helped me change my mindset that, you know, as a storyteller, I shouldn't be putting any boundaries, any limitation that I should actually be doing case storytelling. I haven't done yet, but that is something that is added to my bucket list. So hopefully in 2024, 20, I will be doing some storytelling in a school, in a kid's place or somewhere, but suddenly you change. So this is, this is the way I wanted to start up by, by as a storyteller, we all keep challenging each other and, and that I think is a beautiful thing. So let's start off by asking you, you were a TV producer, you were doing so many amazing things. Why suddenly you got into storytelling and uh, you know, what has been the journey like? So um, I was a television producer, Haritosh, and that's where I started telling stories professionally. Mm -hmm. So I've been telling stories since 2005, except that my format and medium 
and platform was different. Mm. So today I function as an oral storyteller. I design a lot of content uh, for my clients, which is based on storytelling, but may not be uh, purely in the oral space. So video, uh, social media, uh, news reports, communication, yeah. newsletters, um, uh, coffee table books, uh, everything is a story, yes. right? Yes. And um, and uh, that's where uh, what I do. So if I were to talk about when, why did I leave TV? I mean, uh, what? why did I step out of TV to do storytelling? I will say that, yes, I was telling stories even then. And I was telling stories in the audiovisual format. And I was very good at my job. Uh, but motherhood happened and somehow my uh, editor must have thought that, oh, now she can't come at four o'clock in the morning. So mm. let us demote her. So that it, it happened uh, overnight mm. and it happened in a way that took away a lot of my confidence because it made me feel as if all the work that I do is not enough. The good mm. work that I do is not enough. And uh, suddenly somebody else is in, is in control of your story and you don't mm. like that right? It's like being laid off. I wasn't li being laid off, but I was very polite, impolitely being demoted with mm. somebody with somebody put on top of me. And I did not want to do that. I did not want to compromise on the work that I had done or the credibility that I had built just because I am a new mother. And uh, the world of television news is very harsh. It's very, very brutal. And um, you have punishing hours, you have punishing schedules and requirements that require you to be the top of your game, physically, yeah. mentally, uh, and e even, even from uh, your sense of commitment that this is what I have to do. So this is what the job requires me to do. So I have to do it. But overnight when that came and hit me, I had to step step away. I did not want to step down. I said, I want to step out of this, mm -hmm. this environment. And I did. So Haritosh, this is... Uh, 2012 that I'm talking about and right. it was a very happy period of my life uh, it hit me like this huge uh, storm which uprooted me and made me question my whole identity and mm. my skill set and the the confidence that I had built uh, in, in me and um, and I felt this also fake that somebody else holds the reins of your life and uh, you are just uh, like a leaf which has been thrown away and you have to go and find a burial mm -hmm. pit. Um, and of course, the whole identity of being a new mother because you're suddenly being very right. questioned. And and maybe you as a as as, as a male will not really experience that as, as much. Uh, you have a wife, you have a partner who would go through it, you would see it in her way, but you will never, never experience it the way women do. Correct. And over the years, when I've met with so many women who've had similar stories, it's like one of those things, it happens. Why do we have to make a hue and cry about it? I did not make a hue and cry about it. But something in me made me say that being a mother put me under a spotlight, a very uncomfortable spotlight for, for my employer. And now I'm going to try and turn it around and own the spotlight. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to step up and speak and say that, uh, who I am has nothing to do with what I do, what I can right. do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to wish it away, but this is where I get my strength from. So Haritosh, you'll be very surprised that when I stepped out of television and was trying to figure out what do I want to do and what yeah. can I do, do I want to take up a job? I started telling stories to my uh, three-month-old. Wow. Uh, I started telling stories to him when he was three months old. And before that, I had never worked with children. I did not even know what other schools are, what other schools in my neighborhood I yeah. did not even know at what age do children start school, you know, so I was in that kind of a, a phase as a professional. I had no idea what, how to mm. rear a baby. And, uh, I, but all I knew is that I was a voracious reader. I grew up with books and I wanted to read to him. And while he was three months old, he grabbed his first book from my hand. Wow. And when I saw that happen, something made me look up and said, what's happening with him? This opened up this whole world of exploration of how do young children uh, respond to story? Mm. How do they respond to music? How do they respond to the uh, to vocabulary, to sound, to visuals, to animation? Not the one that we see on YouTube, but yeah. let's say the animated voice, the animated sound, the gestures, 
and toys, all of it coming together that how does a child's brain is developed. And that opened up this whole plethora of uh, world, world for me. And mm -hmm. when I could see my child from three months to six months to he was a year old, uh, I could see him respond. I wondered that there is something more to this word than story. So it is storytelling. So what is storytelling and how is how is it unique for children? And I, st I, I still carry my journalism genes. Mm -hmm. And I say, when, when I pick up uh, an area of uh, curiosity or inquiry, I sort of pursue it doggedly yeah. to figure out what's the story behind this. <laughs> so that's how it started. And I started uh, researching and speaking to people, writing emails, reading up a lot of literature. And I discovered this whole world of oral storytelling. Wow. Um, and that's how storytelling happened to me. Um, mm. Storytelling found me, Haritosh. I owe my life to it because I was in a very deep, dark uh, hole before mm. that. Mm -hmm. And what I am today is because I went through that experience. Um, the loss of identity is immense for anyone uh, to be uh, to be rendered useless or not important or let's say not valuable enough because overnight earlier you were and suddenly overnight you're not because you have supposedly you have new priorities uh, is not a very comfortable feeling and uh, it changed my life but I'm in 10 years down the line after I've become a professional storyteller and a storytelling entrepreneur I'm very grateful for that experience the way I look back at that story now is with a lot of gratitude that thank god it happened Otherwise, I would have still been a very bitter, I would have been, I wasn't bitter then, but I would become a very bitter, nasty producer sitting, uh, you know, very comfortably on a producer's chair and making everybody's life miserable. <laughs> so I think I have a much better life. People love to talk to me. I love meeting people. I'm far more pleasant than I would have been if I was in television. And I am, um, I'm far more useful in the world today than I would have been uh, back behind a television screen. I wouldn't have been doing this podcast for sure because <laughs> uh, as a producer, I like being behind the camera. I yes. hated stepping up in front of the camera and speaking. Uh, yeah. But look at me now. Yeah. Now. That, I have more that... hours recorded now than I had while I was a television journalist, which is the funny thing about me. So that's yeah, that's how storytelling, storytelling saved me, to be very honest. It did not wow. discover me. It saved me. And I owe my life to this beautiful art form. That's such an uh, interesting and amazing story. And uh, yes, I do agree that uh, we men, uh, regardless of whoever says what, cannot understand uh, what women go through when they go through this uh, process of becoming mother and all the repercussion that happens. So yeah, I can I cannot say I empathize. I can only say uh, a little bit. Yeah, I, I will try to understand more. Uh, and I do understand that sometimes when harsh things happen, because yes, I, in my journey also a few harsh things has happened. I, I, I don't think I have talked about it in this podcast very openly, but uh, back in 2019, I was I was probably at the peak of my IT career. I'm still I am, uh, but I was doing very good. And, and suddenly out of a blue, because of certain visa rules, I was told to uh, pack your bag and, and get away from this country. You have uh, you are getting one week and at that time i had like in a full house my wife and daughter were in india and and i literally came back from two bedroom house with you know i had a car and everything to literally in two bag uh and i know what it changes i am grateful for that experience right now because it led me to do things which i would have not done so i would not have been this podcast host had that not happened uh and this is i think the life tell us and teaches us sometimes in easy way sometimes it's in hard ways but we all evolve i think that is what what is more important no i don't think life teaches us anything haritosh i think <laughs> life throws us challenges Correct. and the way we respond to it uh determines the way our stories progress we always have a choice we always mm -hmm. have a choice to either to smother ourselves in self pity uh, or uh, take up the challenge and try our best because whatever we do, you it may not be the best outcome. You may mm. not, you may still fail, and you may have to fail many more times over. But I still feel is that life uh, gives us these situations 
for us to find and discover who we are and who we can be. And I Very think that's the beauty of uh, life's challenges. Absolutely. Yeah, this is this is such an in, interesting insight. I never thought in, in this way. Uh, but back to your story. So you came out of uh, this TV production and uh, I'd heard about uh, something called Pandora's Box, which used to have a lot of interesting stuff. But then I heard another thing called your story back. So you founded your story back, uh, which apparently is completing a decade now in 2024. So I love to hear about how did you founded this your story back and what has been the journey like? So it's, it's my company. Uh, uh, so when I started off, like I said, uh, you know, the backstory, I was still trying to pay my bills. And at that point of time, I was working very hard to uh, find kind of jobs which required me to tell stories. I have always been a writer and um, I had the dexterity of not just to speak and to script, but also to write uh, for people. And that point of time, I took up a lot of content work uh, and very niche, high, high niche content. So I wrote ghost wrote, I, I was ghost writing for some big people. Mm -hmm. And I was also helping them uh, put together their communication strategies within their organizations as far as storytelling is concerned. But these were all like little projects through organizations and partners. And uh, at that point of time, I met uh, this gentleman called Apoorv Chamaria. He was in HCL at that point of time. He was uh, in the marketing team and he is right now with Google uh, spearheading the Google startups domain. And uh, Apoor was this turning point in my life. At that point of time, he saw something which I think I did not realize. And I was working as a storyteller. And like I said, I started telling stories to children and that was a very new space for me, something which I had no credibility for no experience in and again my whole journalism career was sort of on the one hand and I was still not doing any form of journalism or storytelling from that space so I was absolutely new and he knew that and I told him that you know yeah I'm, I'm doing this content work and consulting just because I have to pay my bills but you know I'm trying to be a new storyteller working with children and he said hang on Rituparna uh, you've always been a storyteller why are you not seeing that and I said, how? I said, because you've always done television. The reason why you're doing this job for me is because you have the experience of uh, putting a narrative together. And don't mm -hmm. you see that? Um, and why are you just restrained? Why are you looking at yourself as a newcomer in the field of storytelling? As far as children are concerned, yes, you may be, but you have nearly a decade long experience in storytelling and leverage that. And... Uh, Apoor was the one who made me see reason and made me feel that, oh my God, there is a whole set of skills which I have, which people need. Yes. And I'm already doing that in little projects. I just need to put together it, put, put it together in some form of an offering, in some form of a service, in some form of a product so that I can service and fill the gaps with the typical communication agency can't, which a typical training company can't. Uh, again, the art and science of storytelling was so untapped, so unheard of. Mm -hmm. Like uh, they would have organizations would have people flying in from different countries to come and teach them storytelling. And it's and Apoor was very kind to show me that uh, they had anecdote coming from uh, Australia to talk to them about storytelling wow. early on. And he told me what he his some he and some of his member team were part of the the workshop, and he said, "Why? Who was stopping you from doing what they are doing? You already know it." Mm. And I said, "Yes." So it was my first client, HCL, and and Apoor was my first client, and he saw he saw something in me which I did not realize. I just had to rephrase my story. Or, yeah. or look at it from another perspective. And that's how your story bag was born. I was very clear that I don't want to be a freelancer. I don't want to be that I will take on one project or the other. I will put together my products and my services. Uh, I put together my, my skill set to develop products and services, which is going to cater to different industries, uh, different organizations, different sectors, different segments. So uh, while I work with children and have grown tremendously in the last 10 years, 
uh, taught in Delhi University, uh, worked with CBSC, have been a curriculum developer, worked with scores of school teachers across the country, telling them about storytelling and how to use it in the classroom. Nice. I've worked with businesses, uh, corporates, nonprofits, uh, individuals, organizations, created content, story-based content for people who could not think of how do we teach this? What do we, mm. how do we want to um you know, like very interestingly, how do we make our new employees feel a sense of connection with our organization? Uh, how do we talk about uncomfortable things like bribery, like uh, malpractices with our new employees who we are onboarding? So, you know, when my clients have pushed those that envelope, I've been able to create such, uh, and I'm very proud of my work, that I've been able to go into areas which a lot of uh, us may not know exist. What can mm. a story do? I've been walking on this path, which I call the story way right now, and navigating it to see what can a story do in the world today? What can it solve? What can it uh, create? What doors can it open? Yeah. And that's been the journey of your story bag, Haritosh. Uh, so I work with a large number of organizations with a wide, uh, uh, let's say, age group of <laughs> people too and segments so it's not just an individual absolutely the joke at home is my father says that why do you want to be the tata company why do you want to do everything why can't you just focus <laughs> on that? my father says that i come from tata nagar jamshedpur yeah. so the joke is that and i say that well if tata company can do that why can't i <laughs> why can't i tell stories to anyone so i say i tell stories to anyone who has a heart beating for stories That's so if you have amazing. one you, we can work together that's amazing journey and yes i saw the the your story bag website which is really uh interesting and and such a, a wide range of offerings that you have and i think almost for everyone you you can find something over there and i'm going to ask you okay it and it might be a uh, difficult question as well but if you had to choose probably a one moment out of this whole decade long journey what would that one pivotal moment be so uh, many, many, many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the one thing that I will always say is um, when when you tell stories to adults and particularly in groups, uh, you see very curious things happening to them. Some of them will come in as story believers. Like I said, I tell stories mm -hmm. to those heartbeat for stories, which means that they are believers, that they know that the only way to get this thing done is through a story. Right. So they are believers. And there are some who are, uh, they are just, just been asked to be there. And there are some who completely refuse it. They're like, I don't know what this all is, this thing is all about, but let's give it a try. You know, so those kind of people. And uh, there's some who just say that this is not for me. But even without trying it, they are very sure that storytelling is not for them. So uh, the ma magic happens when you put all of these people together. You don't have labels on them and they don't really say it openly. But magic happens when story happens to them. Mm -hmm. I was at this organization uh, doing a workshop with very hardcore trainers. Okay, And these are all L&D professionals. And uh, they, had, they have done hours of training themselves. They have created and designed several learning modules with their organization. People with an average of 8 to 15 to 20 years of experience in that room. Uh, Within that group, we had a two-day workshop and I had given them very simple prompts to find stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And 90% of them came back the next day with very difficult stories about their lives. Stories filled with vulnerability. And as the stories were stacking up, you could see that the story and the storyteller was so deeply entwined that they couldn't help but shed their inhibitions and mm. surrender to that story and that moment when they were telling it. It led to a point where this one person, he stopped because he broke down in the middle of that story while telling it. And the rest of this group, which had been sitting through this whole experience of listening to these tough stories being told, uh, got up and went and hugged him. Wow. And they were all teary-eyed and very fragile and this one person turned to me and said Rituparna what's happening what's happening to us I said nothing story stories are happening to you for the yeah. first time 
you have you have found a space to tell a story which fits a prompt. I did not ask you to tell me about the time when your sibling took a beating from your father or or somebody or or you saw the passing of a of a national hero or you had a near death experience. I did not ask you to share these uh, terrific and terrible uh, moments in your life. Something in that prompt made you go back to that story. And something in you made you tell that story today from the depth of your heart. The story wanted to come out. You may have never told it like this, did you ever? And that was the truth that they had never shared. Most of them, they had never told these stories openly to such a large group of people. And they never shared it with their work colleagues, for sure. Yeah. In some cases, they had never shared this story with anyone. It was the first time it was coming out. So uh, it was such a moving experience for them. And uh, I knew they'd all become story believers in that moment. <laughs> yeah, you had converted them. <laughs> Uh, without me doing anything it was them they did yeah, they did absolutely. the work absolutely. i just had to give them very interesting story prompts that's it yeah love that love that and i don't know whether you have heard about this uh, research done in Princeton, princeton university where they actually did this amazing research where they got an amazing storyteller and they got audiences from very different background and what they did was they applied all these mri boxes and all and and before the storyteller was speaking it, everybody was at different wavelength. But once the storyteller was in action, everyone's wavelength was, as they say, in, in conjunction. And, and you could see that you now the emotions are being passed without having any physical touch or anything like that. So amazingly. And, and... So Harikosh, I have seen it. I yeah. see it all the time. Yes. I'm a performance storyteller. As a performance storyteller, I perform stories before small, medium, large. Yes. audience and i insist on looking at my uh listeners eye to eye because all that you just said about uh the oxford the princeton university study i see it happen every time yes because when you are telling stories to those 100 uh 300 500 faces you can see how they are breathing with you they are nodding with you mm. they are linking with you and they are clued to your story uh, beyond what they would have ever been connected to you if you were just standing absolutely, there absolutely absolutely amazing amazing so there is this interesting thing and this is the perfect segue to the next question you said that you had a lot of non-believers come to your sessions and workshop and of course you cannot go everywhere and teach to every individual but what do you think are the biggest myth when it comes to storytelling and this is one of my favorite questions that I ask to every uh, almost every storyteller or storytelling coach that come to this podcast that what do you think are the biggest myth when it comes to storytelling I think the first is what you and I started talking about which is that it's storytelling is for a certain audience like it's yeah. for children it is not for adults it is not for uh, a dog it is not for the plants you can't tell a folk tale in a business in a boardroom. Yes. Uh, you cannot tell a data story in a in a classroom. Um, it's ridiculous. Why do we want to segment and uh, divide and and categorize stories into so many places? A story is a versatile uh, a tool and an object. Storytelling is a very powerful technique. Yes. Uh, it's a strategic technique. Yes, you can use a story anywhere, anyhow, to uh, make a point, to have a conversation. That's the kind of storyteller I am. I like stories which open conversations instead of me saying, so this is my story and this is what I want you to know. That's that's the kind of storytelling I never, never, never do. And neither do I teach that. I use a story to open a conversation, mm -hmm. uh, a difficult conversation which is waiting to be had or to open a perspective uh, and to leave it uh, leave it to be explored because we have not been looking at the story from another perspective. So that's what I specialize in and that's how I, I teach storytelling. Um, so if you look at my podcast, Golfo Stories from Around the World, that's what yes. I try to do, that I've picked up folk tales uh, and, and myths from around the world and I tell you how can you use it in a classroom, in, mm. in your living room to have a conversation with your family a teacher can use it in a classroom to have a conversation with their class with their students and the same story can travel to a boardroom to make a strategic point to to in the hands of a skillful skilled storyteller 
that story which will take not more than 5 to 8 minutes yeah. can lead to great conversations so when i started telling stories to children to to people everybody said oh are you a children storyteller who also wants to be a business storyteller um how can you be how can you tell stories to an audience where you've never worked with them and what will this story do for them it's not that i um, the biggest myth is that we are trying to straight jacket storytelling it is for someone and it has to be only like this mhm don't believe in that Hi. it's in the hands the story is a it's like clay in the hands of the storyteller you have to mold it you have to give it you have to shape it the way you want it to be shaped mm. uh, to serve a meaning which can be filled into that vessel you have to glaze it you have to you have to put it into the oven you have to harden it and then you have to hand it over to uh, to your listener to hold it and use it i i love that analogy of clay and we all can you know this is what a great analogy does we all can sense that how it must be so thank you so much for sharing that perspective and yes and i i was very open in at the start of the podcast that i also had certain inhibition with kid storytelling but yes i've tried to shed that and i'm going to work definitely in this you are, nobody is a storyteller in the world if they've never told stories in a kindergarten classroom i this is my open, accepted. open open <laughs> call to everyone please walk into a classroom please walk into a children's shelter to an orphanage to yes. go and tell story you will never know what what it will do to you nice. um and it's immensely powerful and you're not a storyteller if you've not done that <laughs> love that awesome so let's uh, change gear and and we were chatting before this recording about a term that i've heard a lot from western uh, storytellers and uh, also coaches and which is a term called story envy where you know we all know people who have gone let's say to everest or got their amputation done have you ever felt a envy that oh wow this person's story is amazing and i don't think i have such amazing story and and if yes then how did you overcome and if you have not heard then I'd love to hear your perspective for people who I have that the, no harish i've never heard the term story envy but uh, i think what you're trying to also get at is this whole template of storytelling that we see all across social media <laughs> which is the rags to riches i have gone through hell and look at me now or i need a big tragedy in my life to be <laughs> able to survive it to tell a story yeah um one of the things which i tell people is that your a story is not a cow stop milking it If the same tra- tragedy story you keep telling it over and over and over again it stops being a story it becomes your medal because you know that this story sells and so mm. i'm going to tell it and unfortunately today in the world of social media this is the kind of storytelling that is making a lot of a uh, noise an uncomfortable noise which i don't like and i don't agree with it so without naming people uh, there are storytelling movements and there are copycat storytelling movements and there are copycat uh, copy paste <laughs> storytelling movements <laughs> which tend to uh, uh, go back to that same script you can remove the name of the person and put and that fill in the blanks yeah <laughs> in the blanks and the story sounds absolutely the uh, yeah, same yeah, 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 yeah. i so that when you see something like that you believe that that is storytelling and that's when you start wondering ha ah, mere life mein to nobody has left me nobody <laughs> left me to love you know i've never been heartbroken or i am you know uh, you know i came come from a place of privilege and my parents did not uh, were not poor so what do i have to tell you know so everyone looks yeah. at those type of things which make you believe that you have to have something that you've mentioned story envy so i don't adhere to that form of storytelling which let leads people to believe that you have to go through hell to be able to tell a story or yeah. you have to have a rags to riches kind of a narrative to be able to tell a story no i am a strong believer in the magic of uh small moments small stories i call them the everyday magic that happens in the middle of a conversation that aha moment that thought that comes to you it's a small anecdote it's a small shift that you experience every day those are the things which make for great stories and um, they happen only when you are happy with who you are mm. they happen only when you are more conscious and mindful of yourself your experiences the interactions that you're having with everyone around you at your work 
if you are if you're curious enough to look up from your mobile phone and look at the world and not say oh let me take a picture because i'm going to make a reel out of it uh, oh let me take this moment because i'm going to tell a nice cabby story out of this you know let me take a selfie with so and so because that's become the story for my day if you can step out of those moments and really live that moment that's where the story happens i love so that so your uh, sorry the and the story and story and me yeah story and me i really i'm i'm really really sorry for the people who feel story and me guys there's a whole world of stories happening to you every day step yeah. out of that opua me kind of a, a thing you you can create great stories as you're living i always say live your day well so that today becomes a story that you will tell tomorrow tomorrow i be i love be that be more mindful of it yeah absolutely and, and and while you were telling all those i it it reminds me that i've seen so many people who yeah i shouldn't be taking any name but i know people who yeah left corporate no, or were made to left corporate and then they say like yeah corporate is bad i was never meant to be i mean yeah. you never did the work in corporate and now you are telling doesn't all matter i yeah. i again that's the other thing which i don't do and i don't always say that don't judge anybody by their story because that's Correct. what suits them we always make a story about ourselves we yes. create a narrative about ourselves and we want people to tell it right mm -hmm. so uh it's not my job to to judge somebody's story uh story and we also leads a lot of people to uh to fabricate stories yeah you know to create something just to like oh it happened to me too you know so uh that's something which i don't recommend i since i work with businesses and i work with individuals at one point of time i helped uh uh students write essays to to study abroad and uh, they never had i mean somebody said i never had an ethical dilemma what do i do can i create one i said no don't do it <laughs> there will be you you have an ethical dilemma somewhere tucked in your life yeah um, you just have to find it and and that whole exercise of finding that tellable story is is what tires them and they said kuch bana dete hain you know let's just create one <laughs> just and i said sing. no you can't do that so a lot of people today haritosh they create stories when there is no story to tell <laughs> i know what you're talking about exactly <laughs> yeah so yeah. i i pity that too so never do that and secondly um, i always say don't let's not judge people on the stories they have their own compulsions there are three kinds of stories which i recommend that happen that there's a story we tell ourselves there's a story we tell others and the third story is the story that people tell about us yeah because we are so worried about what will people tell we tell the wrong we fabricate the wrong story <laughs> to cover up the real story which is us so this is not the same story so yeah. if you can uh, really trust the universe that you be your honest self talk about yourself with utmost honesty uh, don't milk your <laughs> story like a cow um and leave it for people to form a story about you a narrative yeah. about you that's that's beautiful beautiful message uh, awesome so let's move to the next question and i know we could talk about hours and all but we have time constraints so i'm going to keep it to last few questions uh, so i was going through your website and profile and there was this term that you mentioned which was really intriguing which you said that uh, storytelling will be the strongest currency in the world uh, and um, and you want to make it storytelling a sustainable career in india uh, so what do you think are the current challenges because i also get a lot of emails and, and messages for people that know, okay storytelling is great but how do i make a career out of storytelling so what uh, what is your response to such questions so i think the i'll answer the first part the storytelling uh, you picked it up from my ted talk uh, so and a few years back i said storytelling will be the world's strongest currency i can safely say in 2024 that storytelling is yes. the world's strongest currency the fact that you are you are leaving uh, or you are managing a uh, an it career with a storytelling uh, avatar of yourself moving yes. from moving out from public speaking to realizing oh no public speaking is passe storytelling is the in thing and i want to be a storytelling coach yes uh, uh, should tell you that yes it is a currency and which is why you are working towards uh and cashing that currency right <laughs> so um uh, that's that's the answer for you um, mm -hmm. but on another hand i can say that 10 years back i had to explain to people what do i do uh 10 years later i'm very very grateful and i say it with a lot of humility that 
a lot of people when they think about storytelling they think about me or they think about your story bag and uh, somewhere in 2020 i started using this term think storytelling think your story bag with a lot of my clients with a lot of my uh, not friends but i will say people who know about storytelling or who may may not have interacted with me uh, the dots connect they mm. recommend uh, people know of the work that we do as a storytelling organization and that's very very powerful so yes it is a strong currency people come and ask that I'm wondering can storytelling help us do xyz and that's where the magic happens like I said you yes. it's never been done nobody's done this before let's try and do it so uh, great experiments are happening um, the second part is of course how can it make it a sustainable career again to answer that question 10 years back yeah when I started telling stories, people were wondering, Ye karti kya hai? what is she doing? And it was tough for my mother-in-law to explain to, uh, you know, my, my mother-in-law found it very difficult to explain to other people who asked her, what does your daughter-in-law do now? A lot of people would also, uh, now she knows because she has sat through my sessions and she's seen me perform and now she's a great, she, she now she knows the right words to tell people that yes. this is what my daughter-in-law does and she shares my website with people. And not just that, I will say even my mother to, for her to understand because she's the one, you know, as a parent who tries to, did you, how much did you study about this, <laughs> right? Uh, what did you, did you, did you have to go through a course and uh, because I trained storytellers. So she says, where and how did you form this? So, you know, as a parent, she wants to sort of say, that my, I hope my daughter is not a quack. And oh. she's not somebody who is uh, pretending to be something which is not. So my mother, I had to sit her down and tell her, show her all the books that I've, I've read and the, and the kind of work and work I've developed. Take her behind the scenes mm. to show her, this is how I do my work. This is the kind of um, research analysis that I'm bringing into my technique. And that's when she's convinced. So, you know, when your parents are convinced, you are far you more, you're, you're controlled. <laughs> and and they become, and that gives you a lot of confidence that if I can explain storytelling to somebody who's very curious and out of the radar, mm. I should be able to do it for anyone. But uh, to answer that second question, 10 years back, it was something which nobody understood. Today, people understand that. So to make it sustainable, it, the simple recipe is who needs your story? What form of storytelling do you want to do? Uh, mm -hmm. whose problem do you want to solve or and the problem could be something else Correct. storytelling could be the answer to that mm -hmm. and therefore how would you help them solve their problem it's like it's any other business any other profession uh this is a skill there's an art to this form which is very very popular uh, uh to be a performing artist is is one of my life's greatest joys so mm -hmm. i love uh telling stories and and be on stage just to entertain people uh, but I also like the cerebral idea of stories and what it can do. So the artistic part and the scientific part of a story, using yes. it as a tool and using it as a technique. Mm -hmm. So once you've figured out which form do you want to uh, work with, so who do you yeah. want to work with, what do you want to want them to lead towards, uh, you will know where your clients are and what you want to do. It's also very important to know what you don't do in storytelling. Yeah. So while I say that, yes, you must go and tell stories to children. Telling stories to children is the toughest. You will discover parts of your personality uh, while you tell stories to children. But to be able to tell stories to children, you need a very specialized skill set. So which if you don't have, I will not recommend you do it. Similarly, for a lot of people who want to get into business storytelling or working with nonprofits, uh, if you don't know, then you are unable, you should not. In my work, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, intersection with with psychology. Yeah. Uh, for example, like I said, that moment when people cried or why did they respond uh, to a simple story prompt uh, bringing out such difficult stories from their life, uh, that itself is a very uh, interesting area of uh, research. Yeah. And I also tell people that, listen, you're not a therapist. You are not a counselor. So we are just a storyteller. You have created a space. The stories have tumbled out. Now what happens to the person whose secrets have come out or their stories have come out and now they are they are unable to handle the repercussions. So you have mm -hmm. to take it to the person who can handle them. You are not able to handle. So you see what you can do as a storyteller, what you cannot do as a storyteller, you really mm -hmm. need to create those boundaries. And when you do that, you are able to find the kind of work and the, and the clients and the customers 
who require that kind of service from you. Amazing. Thank you so much for such a detailed answer. Really, really, really appreciate that. So uh, this is probably going to be the last question of this podcast, and I'm really enjoying the conversation is that now if I ask that Ritubarna, you have only one minute and you have potential uh, audiences from varied uh, field, varied geography, what is your one message for the listeners of this podcast? Uh, no, I am, I'm too, too small to give a message, <laughs> to be very honest. I think the one uh, little, I call it the story dust, is to just simply go and tell your story. You never know who needs it. You never know what it will do to someone who's waiting for that story to be told. Most importantly, you don't know what's going to happen to you when you tell that story. So tell it for that someone who you don't know exists. Tell it for yourself because you will discover somebody new. You will meet the most honest person out there uh, and just live in that moment. Love that. Love that simplicity of that message. Tell it for someone who needs it and tell it for yourself and you might discover a new version of yourself. Awesome. So how can people approach you because you help people with storytelling at, at different levels. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you and want to utilize your products and services, how can they reach out to you? So the best place would be my website, www.yourstorybag.com, B-A-G, yourstorybag.com. And there's a story behind the name of my company as well. It's on my website. You can go and find that out. Yes. Uh, so yourstorybag.com or you can just simply uh, find me on LinkedIn, on uh, Instagram, Rituparna Storyteller. You can just Google it or just Google Rituparna Storyteller. You will come to me. I'm very, very sure. Yes. So go ahead, try that out. Um, uh, I love to say hellos and I love to listen to people's stories. More importantly, I'm very curious about seeing what happens to you when you tell your story. So uh, come say hello. Awesome. So guys go and please check out Ritu Parna's work. Uh, I follow every post that she puts on LinkedIn, which is amazing. So thank you so yeah. much once again, Ritu Parna. It was Oh, and I have a podcast. I must say that. I'm yeah, yeah, please, please. Myself. Podcast I, my podcast. I forget. I forget to talk about my podcast as Maybe much. Maybe because as you have so many things, so many assets. Yeah. You forget, really. you know, I'm very bad at marketing, Haritosh. I must say that. I wait. I, you know, like we say, uh, so there's a story in my podcast and I'll end this conversation with it that uh, uh, Mullah Nasruddin one day went up this tower and he went up to the tower and he looked out and he said, can you hear me? And everybody in the marketplace, they could hear him. They all looked up and his friends who were sitting in his house, he got out of his house. He hurried towards this marketplace and he started running because Mullah had screamed, can you hear me? But the moment Mullah screamed that, he climbed down the tower and he started running away from the tower, from the, away from the marketplace. So this friend who had heard him and had come to listen to him, he said, Mullah, where are you going? He said, I just want to see how far my voice goes. <laughs> so he's running to find how far his voice goes. And that's what a storyteller really hopes for, Haritosh. How far does his or her voice go? How far does his or her story go? Uh, I have a weekly podcast called Golpo Stories from Around the World in which I share uh, traditional tales and traditional tales which can be told and retold and reused to spark conversations uh, in the classroom, in the living room, in the boardroom. Stories are universal. If you look at it, uh, you can listen to it. Um, anyone can listen to it and share it at home for a dinner table conversation. Switch off the TV, keep your mobile phones away. Don't even listen to my podcast. Listen to it, Alag say, and then you can retell that story. Retell it in your own words and have a nice, fun moment at home. So uh, please follow it. And if you like it, please review it. Awesome. Yes, everybody, please go to Golpo Podcast. And I'm very sure there are so many amazing stories out there. And and if you do not know, I, I, I'm probably on a quest to 
tell 366 stories I saw in, that. yeah so I maybe saw I'll, that. I'll go and sneak some of the stories out there and yeah and, yeah. So, and then you must always you like, like a good storyteller you can always say that oh i, I found this for my podcast yes yes <laughs> <laughs> i will do that for sure thank you so much and yeah it was such a delight to have you i learned so much and it was so many precious moments so i i see uh probably uh, a follow-up podcast maybe in a few months and we'll have some more fun some more yeah, amazing absolutely. anecdotes and i i, 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 want, I also yes. wanted to ask you Haritosh, that you uh, signed up for abcf storytelling 2.0 on my learning portal uh did you go through it yeah <laughs> i did bring because <laughs> yeah I, I i didn't want to tell a lie but uh, i i uh, had an oversight i probably i saw a few videos at the start but you know there's so many things happening so but the videos that i saw are very high quality and very educational but i haven't gone and this is on me not on you uh, <laughs> to complete that and and go through the full thing uh, but yes hopefully in 2024 when i get time this you know we all have this mess and a lot of things going around so when when the winds little bit settle down i will definitely go that is in my plate but whatever i went through the initial videos it was very uh interesting insightful and uh yeah you had some amazing uh things to work upon so i've taken a few action items for me fantastic fantastic as long as you're working on your story Haritosh, you'd only get better as a storyteller thank you i appreciate that uh and such an honor so thank you so much i'll see you in future episode for sure take care and for my listeners if you like this episode do rate us and review us and let us know through Instagram, LinkedIn, what other kind of question do you have? What other kind of guest do you want? I will certainly try to accommodate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Haritosh, for having Thank me you. over. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Small Town Bigger Dreams Podcast Season 2. Hope you found this useful. If you did, rate us on Apple Podcasts so that it reaches more people. Do share this episode with someone who may need to hear this. I can't wait to see you for the next week's episode. You can also take a screenshot and tag me on Instagram as Coach Harito Srivastav. I hope you have a lovely day ahead. Until next time, as I say every time, keep learning, keep growing and keep going out of your comfort zone. This is Harito Srivastava. See you next week.